All right, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this global read, uh, this webinar series. We are so happy to have the book Social Change 2.0, a blueprint for reinventing our world by the author, David Gershon. Thank you, David, for being here. And we feel extremely lucky and grateful to have Dr. Julie Kroll as a facilitator who will be directing this conversation. As always, this is being recorded and will be later posted on our YouTube channel. And also we're going live on Facebook and later on we'll be, oh, I already said we're gonna be on YouTube. So if anybody has any questions, please post them on the chat. We will be asking those questions at the end of the global read. Um, but more than that, thank you so much, both David and Julie for being here and the floor is yours. Mm. Thank you, Felipe. And what an honor it is to be here with this community. I'm really happy to bring this conversation forward and to support the work of David Gershon and Social Change 2.0. So, hello, David. How are you? Good, Julie. Thank you for saying yes to be the host or facilitator of this event. Very grateful. Yeah. You're welcome. I had to, I had to say yes to you, David, and the, the work that you're doing, and more importantly, the the transformation of how we do social change on the planet. So we're going to dig into that and why you wrote Social Change 2.0. But I want to start with kind of a, a important quote. I had a friend who has passed about two years ago, who was a peacemaker. He was an agent of, of change, wanting to make peace, started two peace organizations. And he would always say, he would quote the statistics that said that in one survey, I can quote the survey, I don't even know what it was, but in one survey, almost everyone desired world peace in the survey. So it was like in the 90s, almost everyone, 90 some percent, desired world peace. And the second statistic he would share was that almost everyone surveyed in the same survey said they didn't believe it was possible. And that discrepancy drove him to work on what do we need to change? How do we change our thoughts? How do we? And this really, really approaches this book to me, David, because we don't know how to do social change and you've evolved the way we're looking at it and systems theory and, and looking at change. So today we're gonna to talk about how to reinvent social change, how to reinvent social activism, and then what are some real life examples of how we do this? So I'm really grateful for you. And I think you put, this quote on your website, if we want to change the world, we must first change the way we think about change. So let's begin there, David. Why rethink the way we think about change? What do we need to do to reinvent change? Well, um, I would say why we need to do it is because the current world doesn't look very good and the current strategies that we're deploying to change the world are not producing the results. So that's why we need to change the way we think about change and implement change. And that has been my journey for some four decades, not necessarily assuming that I was gonna know how to change the way we think about change, but I just went about creating change in the things that I thought were important to change. <laughs> and in the course of that, discovered a framework, a model that was reinventing the process of social change. We call it second order change. And so the book is how to do it. The project that we might talk about, Peace on Earth by 2030, is a exemplar of how to apply second order change to an issue that most of humanity would like to see, but doesn't believe is possible. Let's begin with first order change then in systems theory, that's incremental change. And you talk about passing laws or forcing them to change, financial incentives or paying them to change, information campaigns or telling them to change and social protest or demanding them to change. 
and what you've learned over your decades in the field is none of those work. They haven't been working. They're no longer working. I don't know. Did they ever work, David? And then, well, so I, I would is phrase it a first order. They work under certain conditions and they work to bring about incremental change at its best. So the problem is that we need more than incremental change. We need transformational or single order change. So let me build a context for this and then we'll piece on, piece, put, all these, put all these pieces together. So the world is a function of our many social systems we've created, healthcare, education, political, uh, financial. Those systems currently are not working very well where they're completely broken and dysfunctional. A poster child is our political system in Washington. We can't produce the outcomes, even incremental change. So when a social system is not working and there's demands placed on it that are not being met, then what starts to happen is that there is deep stresses in the system. It starts becoming unstable because it can't meet the demands and it starts to perturbate and ultimately it breaks down or becomes marginally functional. That's the bad news, but there's also good news because if it breaks down because it's unmoored from that, which keeps it in place, it can't perform, then it can also break through to a higher level of performance and social value, which we call second order change. And the process of furthering second order change is the book, Social Change 2.0. And you've already identified first order change, which don't meet those needs of deep and profound transformation. So what's left is empowering people to want to change. And what does that is compelling vision of the possible and the means to do that. And so all the projects that I've moved forward and everything I'm moving forward now are designed around a compelling vision of the possible and the means to do that. And that empowers people. There's a lot more to it, but that's the, the framework. Okay. So the, the difference being, I just, I watched a video this morning. I should have, I, I captured two beautiful quotes. I should have brought them into the office with me because they were gorgeous. And it was about this community in Alaska that had a conservation park and they all came together to, to build, well, actually volunteers from a distance came to work with the local community because the Alaskans love saunas. And they came to build this large sauna in the middle of this Alaskan conservation area for the locals. And they were building it for something in the future. It was like, it, it was a cultural thing. It was something beautiful. And the quotes were about that very thing, David, like they had a meaningful vision. They were giving to themselves and they kept saying things like, this is how we've always evolved. Like when we have a vision of the future, and then we come together with the tools to make it happen. We as a culture evolve. So I just want to pause before we go into the real life examples of how people can use this in their life and talk about that piece of evolution, because you and I also share a um, belief in this new move from the single cell to the multicellular um, organism in evolution is a good pattern for us to look at with individuals coming together, groups, organizations, networks coming together in multicellular um, evolutionary processes, but with this meaning and this vision to evolve, to create peace on the planet or whatever. So talk a little bit about how this is also the evolutionary pattern we're looking at right now and how second order change can help us fulfill this larger destiny. Well, Second order change is built around five core competencies, which we can maybe spend some time on. The first is empowering people. And I just gave you how that happens, um, a vision of the possible and the means to enable that at a personal or an organizational or a community or a planetary level. It doesn't make any difference to scale. The second is around the process of transformation, how you move a individual or an organization or a community or a social system or a organ or a planet from where it is to a place that doesn't exist how does that transformational process take place 
Uh, the third is around the process of innovation, particularly social innovation. We have to design the platforms, second order change social innovations that can produce the transformation and the empowerment. So we have to know how to design uh, these social innovations. Without them, all we have is aspiration and some basic process methodologies, but we need a social innovation to enable that. And then the fourth, uh, which speaks a little bit to shift from single to multi multicellular organisms, is the process of uh, mobilization, which is a process of, excuse me, the process of unity, how to unify a field, how to enable greater outcomes that would not occur if people were operating as individuals or individual organizations. So that process is the process of moving from single to multicellular organisms. And that's a process that we call the art of building a unitive field and the art of enabling optimum synergy so that one and one equals three. That's the fourth part, which drills down a little bit into what you were describing. The fifth part is on mobilization. How do you diffuse if you can't force people to change or pay them to change, or if you do, they're not responding at the level that's needed. And you have to figure out how to mobilize them voluntarily. And the way that one does that is that the vision pulls them and it is something they want. And so they go towards it. They want a better life. They want a better community. They've been a better world. You can show them how to do that. They're not gonna be resistant to that. When you just tell them about things, that doesn't create a better world, so they're not drawn to it. If you pay them, they probably aren't ready to create a better world just because they may save some money or be reducing the penalty for, for money. Awareness doesn't do it by itself. Protest doesn't do it. So what gets people there is this idea of a vision that makes their life or their community or their world better. And if you can deliver that, then there's no resistance because everyone wants that. The key is how to deliver. And that's where the second order change framework fits together to do that. Okay. So that's a beautiful introduction then for us to think of an example. So I'm going to just let our listeners know this is this is an incredible manual and there's ways to study. We'll drop that in at the end. Um, this is going to tell you the how, but this is a framework that will bring real life transformative action um, alive and, and help to empower people. So the Peace on Earth by 2030 game is a really good example of, it, it ties back to my introduction. Everyone wants peace on the planet. Everyone, like 90 some percent of those surveyed said, yes, I want peace on earth. And yet that high percentage said, I don't think it's possible because they haven't had a framework. So let's apply social change 2.0, second order change to the issue of peace. And tell us a little bit about Peace on Earth by 2030 game and how that employs those five social strategies that can help us really mobilize on a much larger scale and create peace. Well, my favorite question, how do we create peace on Earth? Um, this has been my sacred mission for the last almost 50 years. We passed a torch of peace around America during the bicentennial to rekindle the spiritual values upon which the country was founded. And at the completion of that event, um, I received my marching orders, my mission for my incarnation, which was to create peace on earth. And so I've been at this now almost 50 years. And so I've learned some things and I've tried some things. So let me share a little bit about that and then we'll see how they all fit together. Um, so based on that experience of this torch relay, the idea was to pass a torch of peace around the world, to bring the world together in the spirit of cooperation and to create peace on earth. So that was a pretty mighty aspiration. And um, I fell short many times. I'm still falling short, I might add, but I'm making progress. In 1980, um, I started to wonder if I could get this to work. Actually, about 1978, having failed consistently. And I got a phone call from the Olympic Committee and said, and they said, would you be willing to organize the Olympic torch relay from Lake Placid, uh, from Olympia to Lake Placid? 
we'll give you Air Force One as we'll throw that into the package. And you're, you've, you, you basically cornered the market on torch relays and we need your help. This is not a hard sell because I was wondering how I was going to do this. And I realized I wasn't getting traction. The idea was too far from anyone's reality of peace on earth and passing a torch of peace around the world. But I, I needed to learn a lot of things before I could get to that next level. I did that event. It was remarkably powerful for me. We learned the power of, of, of the myth and ritual and the fire. And, and I thought that was it. It wasn't quite how I thought it would be, but it seems like a good thing that happened and it moved that idea forward. 1983 is now the heart of the Cold War. We are now in this place of mutually assured destruction where we have no way out. And it seemed to me that we needed to find an, another non, a non sequitur, a way, almost like another level on the chessboard. And that was this event, this unitive event. And so I asked my wife if she knew anyone in a foreign country. She said no. Um, so we started with really a wing and a prayer and a little experience. And, and then the universe took over. This intention and the need pulled us into this vacuum. And three years later, 1986, the International Year of Peace, we passed the torch of peace around the world. And a billion people witnessed it through the media. 25 million people participated directly, 45 leaders of the world. Uh, in 62 countries, and wherever the torch of peace went, all war stopped. We didn't create peace on earth, but we witnessed the, the pathway to peace on earth. We experienced it for 86 days. Something powerful happened. And when I stepped back, I realized I had a part of the knowledge. I need a lot more knowledge. And so I set out unconsciously to learn what I need to learn. I need to learn how to achieve behavioral change at scale. It wasn't enough to just raise consciousness. I need to learn how to mobilize communities to make changes. It wasn't enough to just have individuals make change. I need to understand the science of tipping points. I need to know how one because we experienced a tipping point in the first earth run, but that was a one-off event. How do tipping points work? We need to understand the process of being able to really move this notion of transformative social change forward or second order change, although I had no language for it. Fast forward, I learned all those things over the next decades. And uh, this idea, which had never gone away, reemerged. Uh, because it was my mission, it was instilled in my soul. And I said, okay, it's time to take what I've learned from the seven practice, seven strategies. We, we called out seven strategies that enabled uh, the first earth to succeed. And then the knowledge of social change 2.0. And that evolved into the peace game and peace on earth zones and the peace on earth by 2030 movement. So that's a bit of its history. Um, we can dig into any number of those elements, including how the peace game works or the peace on earth zone or the larger vision of how we want to uh, move it forward, how we are moving it forward to get to this grand aspiration, what some might call crazy idea of being able to pull off peace on earth. I, I do want to ask you more specificity into the seven strategies of how we do this, <clears throat> because I think it gives us, number one, a reorientation to what's possible, but also to look at first order change. And it, my friend who I opened with the, the, those statistics, he was all about eradicating a nuclear bomb and he couldn't yell loud enough. And he, he, he worked diligently for decades to do that. And we have many beloved friends who are doing that now. There's a peace pool here and there's a couple others here in the room that have peace pools. And so the idea of the way to stop war is to stop nations from warring 
perhaps isn't where we begin. So let's talk about those strategies and how we move second order change to empower individuals to be that change. I might add, Julie, you have an advantage here because you played the peace game and you were an exemplar. You played it at a very high level of impact. So you know from which you speak. Um, so when we distilled what enabled peace on earth to happen for 86 days, we distilled it into seven core um, practices, if you will. Empowerment, oneness, unity, cooperation, abundance, love, and faith. Each of these is a, is a journey. Uh, empowerment is really the capacity building of, around agency. I am, I can, I have the ability to act. I can be effective. You can't really become a peacemaker unless you have agency. That's not a strategy, but that's the foundation for any change and for any change agent. So that's where we begin. <clears throat> and then we move into what we call the peace building actions. And that's oneness, unity, and cooperation. So oneness is learning how to befriend someone who you would normally reject. You call them the other. They are often called the other in different circles. Unity is around learning how to celebrate that which we share in common with another. That's the action that you really excelled in, your amazing story uh, in your community. Um, but you look for common ground and you find that which you have in common, not what separates you, but what brings you together. You find that common cause and that aligns you. And then the third of the peace building actions on cooperation is working together for the common good. What is the common good we could create if we learn how to cooperate better? And then the process of cooperating is the process of aligning around a common vision of what that common good could be. And so that's the third, the fourth action, the third of the peace building actions. And each of these actions takes place in the context of a game with a team, we call the peace team. And the, it has the online version, which is approximately two months or nine meetings where people apply these actions and then they get feedback from their team and from the community. So they have a support system, social support system. The fifth action is on abundance. And this is the fifth and the sixth actions are what we call the field building actions. So this is building the, the field that enables this kind of change to happen. And the, so the, the fifth action on abundance is paying for and supporting through your time, peace groups that are furthering one or more of these uh, peace building actions. So it's not just peace groups. So a nuclear, um, trying to stop nuclear war wouldn't fit for our criterion. It would be a group that's furthering, befriending the other, celebrating our common humanity or cooperating for the common good. And what you'll start to see with all these actions is they're starting from self. And this is the fundamental shift because the world isn't going to change because governments are now stopping doing something which they are not predisposed to do because it goes against their instincts to protect the national safety and security. So building armaments is more core to their reality than anything else. But if people change, then the world changes. So it has to start with individuals. That's not enough, but that's the start. And then the sixth of the actions is called love, which is a specific way we express love, which is uh, agape love or um, love of humanity, which is praying for and visualizing peace. And the seventh action is on faith, which is being able to now have the faith to believe that such a, a dream is possible, having the faith that if I go forward, I can engage other people and they will want to participate, not to believe that no one else cares but me. And so that's to engage other people to play. And we invite people to create at least two more peace teams and that creates the potential for exponential growth. So those are the seven peace actions that evolve into what we call a peace on earth zone where these now become practiced by people in the community. 
And they also become a mechanism to bring organizations together to cooperate for the common good, not just peace organizations, but all organizations trying to create a common good, which includes the private, public, and the civil sector. So that's the mechanism. And I'll just add two more parts. One is that the vision is to have 50 million, well, actually it's 40 million, people playing the peace game. That's one half of 1% of humanity, which is the tipping point for shifting consciousness. And 10,000 peace on earth zones anchoring these practices. That's how we see this working. And we have a strategy to achieve that by 2030. Part of what I love about the game and the strategy <clears throat> that goes back to those social change superpowers is that when you play the game, it really fosters more local innovation and local community and local, you know, like the, the connection and the empowerment is local because you're playing it in your life. And yet your life may be very global as well. Like it, it might be a community food garden or it might be, you know, raising millions for an organization out there. There's this, this whole scalability that comes from, and I'm going to say this because this is my favorite thing about social change 2.0 in the P on earth game is you reminding us to come to our growing edge. It's like when we learn that change only comes when I, when I get out of my comfort zone, right. then I can go make change. Say a little bit about that growing edge, David, would you please? Sure. Well, you know, when we drill down <clears throat> into the empowerment um, part of the framework, uh, it's built on our 40 years of learning how one empowers oneself, how one empowers any situation. And so the framework is built around three principles and a methodology. The first principle is a shift from pathology, focusing what we don't want, focusing what we want. One of the challenges with protest is there's no vision to pull people forward. So that's, it always falls short. You can get just so far with guilt, fear, and anger. Um, the second one is to shift from static to organic growth. So static is there's a place to get to. I'm either there or I'm not. And organic growth is how the natural world lives and exists and bring us alive. It's always got the next place of growth. We call that the growing edge. And the growing edge is that place that I've not been before. Going there will take me out of my comfort zone because I've never been there before. I don't know it, but it's where I'm most alive. And so the peace game is played on the growing edge. It's not like, check, I know how to do oneness. It's like, what's my oneness growing edge? What's my befriending the growing edge? What's my cooperation growing edge? The third part of the, of the model is the integration of awareness, which is knowing something through different kinds of awareness techniques and behavioral change. Knowing is not the same as actually changing. So you need to know how to create behavioral changes. Again, the game is played around this notion of behavioral change on your growing edge in those seven areas. And then just to share the methodology briefly, it's got four parts. We call it the empowerment methodology. Where am I now? So where am I now around befriending the other or oneness? Where do I want to go? What would be my vision? What would it look like if I could achieve that level of connection with other human beings? And then once you have the vision, all the reasons why you can't get there come visiting you unsolicited. We call them limiting beliefs. And these are the yes, buts. Yes, but I don't have the time. Yes, but I don't like those people. Or yes, but it's going to make me uncomfortable to try to change something that I don't know how to change. So the limiting beliefs come. And then you have to learn what to do with them how to transform them or turn around. And so the process also allows you to learn how to do these transformations. So you can find out where that next place of growth is or your growing edge. And so that's effectively the process, but it's not just the process of playing the peace game. And as you pointed out, you play the peace game in your life. You don't go out of your life. So whatever's going on in your life, the people, the organizations, the issues, that's where the peace games play because that's where you're having impact and 
can make the biggest difference for yourself and the world. But it also is played in your community. So then your community goes through a similar process, particularly as more and more people learn how to play the peace game and learn how to practice these actions. You know, imagine a city operating from these practices, empowerment, community cooperation, and so on. It's, 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 a, it's a transformational experience to live in such a place. And we've got some of those places now in play in Africa, in Crestone, in a few other places across the country that are emerging. So Peace on Earth Zones is where you evolve this to. Changing myself is not enough. As I said earlier, you know, I need to empower myself, but that's not enough. I need to empower my community. I empower my community and I do these things in my community and my community transforms and it becomes an exemplar and a model. And communities are always looking. You know, a lot of people here are connected with compassionate cities. They're always looking for models on how to make their community better. And so we're building such a model, a profound model, I might add, that I think will be quite powerful for, and many people from the Compassion City Movement are part of the peace game right now. So um, we're learning how to integrate partner. That's another one of the multicellular organism elements, right? You have to work with partners if you're gonna get anything done. You can't do it by yourself. Thank you. And thanks for dropping in that limiting belief piece that brings us to our growing edge when we turn that around, because that goes to my opening story too, that people don't believe it's possible. That's a limiting belief. And you give us the tools to really challenge that, turn it around and move into our own growing edges. So I love that. So I have two questions before we open it up. I know there's a few questions here in the room, so I want to get to them. But you, Matt, you mentioned Charter for Compassion, but first I just want you to give us a global landscape of what's emerging because this partnership is really taking off. And, and you mentioned Africa, but literally people are playing the game in the Middle East and in Africa and like all over. So just give us a global landscape. And then I want to ask you about um, another thing about those who are yeah. listening. To me. Thank you, Julie. Um, so we have been evolving this idea ever since 1976, but it has gotten on the ground with the creation of the peace game five years ago. And we piloted it initially in Afghanistan uh, because I was working in Afghanistan. So we wanted, to, and we also said, well, if it could work in Afghanistan, I mean, my God, it could work anywhere. And it was so profoundly received they were so excited to see a path that wasn't trying to change government practices. So it wasn't trying to end nuclear war, but creating a different world in which there isn't nuclear war because that's not what's showing up in people's experiences of how they want to live. And so eventually they start to transform their governments and some of these other things. But the bottom line is that once you start to create these changes from the individual community level, it eventually starts to change the whole social structure. I mean, that's a longer process, but you're focusing on where you have opportunities to get the traction initially. So we have now had almost um, 6,000 people play the peace game. They've taken 35,000 peace actions. We estimate each time a peace action is taken and influences about 35 people. So almost 9 million people have been impacted in some form or other by someone taking one of these peace actions. We've played the game in some 15 countries and we are now partnering with many organizations. We have over 54, one of which is your own organization, another one of which is Charter for Compassion. Uh, some of the larger well-known organizations are the Rotary Club and the Rotary International, and they are seeing this as a mechanism to enable their clubs to produce better change in their community and bring greater value to their community and empower their members to show up. Peace is a key part of their, of their vision. Another one is the African Union, and they see their continent in need of something like this, and so they've committed to peace on earth by 2030 in Africa amazingly, and many other stories, Charter of Compassion. I mean, it's so beautiful, the, the new partnership we've developed with them, and that's why I'm on this you know, global read. 
because they have built, I think, some 650 compassionate cities that are now looking for how to go to the next level. So many of them are now playing the peace game in Austin and so San Antonio and a few other places that I, I may not remember. I don't remember off the, hand, off, off the top. Um, and it goes on. You know, one of the key things in getting multicellular organisms to become multicellular is not just, you know, saying, I, I, I think what you're doing is great. I'll tell my members about this. It's being able to get mutual benefit. So unless each partnership furthers what they're already doing more than than it would if they didn't invest time, it doesn't go anywhere. So we're also learning how to create really powerful partnerships that represent the future of how we need to interact with one another. That's how we build multicellular organisms. And then if you get a number of partnerships, then you start to get synergies amongst them as well. So this partnership model is a, a key part of, well, it's one of the five um, parts of the framework, which is the art of building the human field. Beautiful. So you kind of addressed my other questions. So I'm going to go to some of the questions in the sure. um, participants here, David. And one of them is is one of mine. <laughs> Because I, and you've heard me say this before, yes. but we had, we have a participant who has an issue with the idea of game. Why game? I do not see a game of reality. Um. So Felipe said, valid thought, Mark, let's ask about the idea behind calling this social change proposal a game. So let's talk about why a game. And I am, you know, I was really opposed to game and I, because of the gaming culture and, and from my background as a psychotherapist, I have known of so many millennials who have been addicted to gaming and it's caused great trouble. And yet gaming appears to be a real, um, what would we say as zeitgeist of how people are approaching a lot of things? The Compassion Games is a partner with with Charter for Compassion. Um, you know, a lot of people love the idea of gaming. You introduce the playful part of it instead of the addictive part of it. So let's talk about why a game and why do you call it a game? Well, one of the great things I've learned over the course of time is this notion, Homo Lunis, Lunis, L-U-D-E-N. S, which is human beings a player, that the fundamental way human beings orient themselves and children emulate this, model this, is in the spirit of play. When things become hard and arduous, then we become the adult. And then life gets really serious and we become very responsible. All good things, I might add, but we lose something. We lose that spirit of play. We lose that freedom. We lose that ability to go into life with a childlike spirit of the possible. You need that, by the way, if you're going to go on a journey called Peace on Earth by 2030, I might add. So that's one element, but there's more. Um, when you fully engage, like say the Olympic Games, you are using the format of the game as an accelerator of excellence. This game is not about competition, it's about cooperation. So but it has that spirit that moves you, particularly when you play on a growing edge. Some people have a challenge with the word game because of their prior associations. So one of the things we invite people to do when they play the peace game is to have a willing suspension of disbelief and to come in with an open mind and a whole heart and then allow the experience to do what it needs to do. So for some, the word game is not an attractor. For some, it is an attractor. There's not many things that the peace game represents that doesn't have someone with a point of view about it. That's all good. Um, the main thing is the vision. Do you want this? And do you want to learn this? And if so, then go on the journey and, and make a judgment afterwards about it. And, and you did. So maybe you could speak to your experience of how this transformation happened for you because you and, and others have opinions about things, particularly as we are thoughtful people. We 
make judgments about things that we like or we don't like. Yeah. Well, we do have four or five more questions here and I want to get to those. Okay. So I think that was a, that was a good answer. This one might take a long time. So maybe you can bring that into a synopsis, David, but can you describe what peace on earth looks like? Yes, I can. Um, well, let's start with, um, there is a sense of deep and profound oneness between people. Let's ground it in place, because otherwise it gets too abstract. Let us let me speak about what a peace on earth zone looks like, a place, a community, your community, and what it would look like if it was a peace on earth zone, because the end game is, if you will, no pun intended, is that there are 10,000 of them. Every city is one. So that's where we're ultimately aiming to go. But there is this deep sense of people befriending one another. There are no others. That, that idea falls away. There's a lot of agency. People are going towards it. They're not passive. They're not deferring to government to somehow fix the problem. They're not complaining. They're solving their problems because they have that agency and they're having the tools to do that. Um, there is this profound sense of cooperation. Organizations are cooperating for the common good. They're achieving things. It's not just the nonprofits. The nonprofits, the public sector, the private sector are cooperating. And there's an immense amount of social good being generated. It's not a static place. It's an alive place. People are working from this place of their growing edge. Uh, there is a deep sense of celebrating that which we find often has separated us. What do we share in common? How can we better interact with one another. And there's events and community opportunities to do that. There's a lot of abundance because people are supporting one another. So it's more generative than I don't have enough and I have to play all by myself or operate in my own little silo if I'm gonna make change or even do anything. So this whole spirit and this generosity and abundance starts to show up. There's a beautiful spirit because people are praying for one another and praying for peace in their communities and all the places where there is tension is starting to get dissipated because of those quality of those energies. So that's what it starts to look like. And it's applied to whatever the community wants it to do to make it a better place. Now imagine the world with that and you start to see what peace on earth looks like. The seven practices in my judgment are the foundation for creating that. So I just want to point out for you listening, if you didn't catch that, David's vision for what peace on earth looks like was the framework and the seven practices within the game. He just described what peace on earth looks like through what he empowers people to do through the game. That was a beautiful answer and a good strategy for us as we're working in community to create goals together, to create that vision and really empower Social Change 2.0. Which brings me to a really good question from David. Our friend said, without going through the game or reading the book, how can we help other people understand and embrace Social Change 2.0? The change of mindset, question mark. How do we do that? I wanna say one thing before I answer that question, just to pull pieces together. What you heard in that description of what peace on earth looks like is a second order change strategy implemented at a community scale and then scale globally. So we were getting empowered. We had a transformational strategy of where we are and where we want to go to where we want to go. There was a social innovation being described, the social innovation being the peace game in the peace on earth zone and the strategy that enables a peace on earth zone, which is scaling the actions or the practices. There was the bringing of all the sectors together, the public, private, and civic sectors, create cooperation for the common good. So building a unitive field, not just the peace teams working together, but all the different organizations. And then the fifth part was the mobilization, which is scaling the game, getting more people to participate. So I, I want to put all the pieces together because you see in how a peace on earth zone is designed, second order change being implemented pragmatically. What is a simple way 
to start moving the notion of second order change into the world, I would say the simplest way, not the most sophisticated by itself, but the easiest to implement is to ask a question. What do I want? What do you want? And how do we create it? Not what's wrong and how do we fix it? But what do you want? What do we want? What does our community want? And how do we create it? That shifts the mindset into being generative. It starts inviting a vision from each person. So they start to become generative of their own dreams. It invites them to dream. We don't know how to dream very well. Many of us are afraid to dream for fear we'll be disappointed. Um, so that would be the starting point um, for a journey. Because when that was the starting point for my journey, I realized early on I wasn't interested in fixing things. I was interested in creating things. Way more interesting, more way more creative than to just fix problems. That would be sad, right? To spend my life defining my creativity by a problem. I like to define my creativity by my imagination. So that that's that's probably the easiest path forward. And to do that in one's life as well as one's community in the larger world. Okay, there's there's a few really good questions here. I hope we can get to them all. Here's one, David. Don't we need, I think you already answered this, but you can put an exclamation point on it. Don't we need both first order and second order change? For example, first order active nonviolence resistance to our current domination systems, such as the military financial complex, and second order creative nonviolent movement of politics of of a politics of love so do we need both yes. first order the answer order? is you need first order change first order change is always going to be there and necessary it's just not sufficient when you need deep and profound transformation it's not designed in fact it's designed to play in this incremental way because it's you know, if you think about how government is organized, it's not designed to create change. It's designed to build stable systems and keep them functioning and do the basics. You know, that's why at a, at a national level, trying to get a government to disarm goes against its very purpose, which is security and safety. So you've got to create change in a different way from the bottom up. And that starts to transform the whole field in which government operates. And I might add, <clears throat> One of my experiments and theses that I want to test in a piece on Earth's own is how does government get transformed when people operate from these seven practices? How does that influence how government does what it does? How mm -hmm. might governance change? It's fundamental. Um, and it's going to change if enough people show up in a different way. Right. Is there a collective growing edge? My judgment, peace on earth, is the collective growing edge. This is the demarcation point for a civilization's maturity. And I would add peace on earth isn't the end game. Again, I use end game. I guess I use game a lot in my world. Um, uh, it's really the creating of the golden age, which is the moment when a civilization matures to being an advanced civilization. And then we start moving forward into possibilities we haven't even imagined. One of my beliefs is that these seven practices create that portal into the golden age and become part of how the golden age is going to be lived and dreamed. And again, I'm moving into the vision of the possible, not how bad is the world and how are we going down? In fact, the way I perceive the world is we have to deconstruct before we can construct the new. This is an essential part of it, but we have to have a path forward for where to go. And every day I'm working on peace on earth. So I don't spend a lot of time on the deconstruction, although I'm, it's, a, it's, it's, it's demanding of one's compassion and empathy to, want, to witness it for sure. Okay, we just got another really good question in. So I have two, and I so I'm going to give you about if you be mindful, David, about two minutes for each of these responses. Okay, um, because I really want to ask both of them. So first, from Barbara, David, some of the systems which beg change on the planet can overwhelm and cause paralyzing grief. How do we get past grief? 
how do we engage or re-engage the self or people who are frozen in their grief? I, I know, I know why you're so interested in that question, given who you are. Um, so let's see, what would I, what do I want to say about that? I think there is a moment where humanity has to accept the deconstruction and the grief is part of it and the mourning of what we are dealing with as we go through this profound breakdown of the social systems. Um, so I think it's always important to go towards wherever the growing edges are, and that is a growing edge. How does one do that? Well, what I found is, you know, if you follow the methodology, which isn't to say that everything fits into the methodology, but this one does, because we've done a lot of work around this. Where am I now around this grief or this pain? Where would I like to be? What would I like it to look like that goes beyond that? Uh, including the fact of accepting it, but then moving beyond it. What limiting beliefs do I have to have? It's really not easy to dig out from the hole that the media puts us in and witnessing so much of the world puts us in. This is where our spiritual work shows up. This is where our um, spiritual bank account gets drawn upon. You know, what assets have we built in terms of our interior development? How do we hold a positive charge in the face of challenging situations? How able are we to hold um, a thought of the possible when we see so many things challenging around us? That's the spiritual work of this time. And then how do I work the growing edge? So this becomes a, a learning and growth opportunity for me. That's how I work with it. My friend, Andrew Harvey, always he talks about spiritual <laughs> activism and says, what breaks your heart open is where your service is. Like that's your clue yeah. to engage yeah. in your sense of service. I love that. Yeah, that's okay, good... from Ruth. <clears throat> from Ruth, if there are more peace organizations in existence today than ever, why does the polarization between groups and individuals seem to be growing rather than diminishing? Is the polarization a reaction or a new development in our evolution? So two points. One is polarization in the world at large versus peace groups. And then maybe even polarization in strategies of peace groups. So I'll speak to both of those. Um, a friend of ours who's working with us, one of our partners, uh, Pesekaya Gabrielle, uh, who's the executive director of Pathways to Peace, uh, said, David, what you're doing is empowering the peace movement. The peace movement hasn't had a vision, a positive vision of the possible, or the means to enable it. So what we're finding is that right now we're attracting many, many groups that want to partner with us because we can bring them together in this way that furthers what they're already doing uh, more than not partnering with us and therefore they wish to. So I would say there's a question of quality, not so much quantity. What is the quality of the peace groups and how impactful are they and how effective are they and, th and that's the growing edge of the peace movement, which primarily has always been an anti-war movement, I might add. But then there's the polarization of the world at large. And, and that is one of the pain points. And that's why this initiative is getting so much traction because people are feeling the pain of the polarization and they want to do something about it, but I don't know what to do. This is a mechanism to enable that. Awesome, David. Thank you so much. I just want to presence um, some conversation that about the grief question that I think is important. Um, Leslie brought up the work of, of Joanna Macy, which I completely agree with. And Steve agreed also talking about Joanna's work, work that reconnects. And then also the Active Hope book that she co-authored, which are also great resources for the grief. David, this has been, a, oh, you want to add to that? Well, I know, I know, Joanna, I know Chris Johnson, who created the Act of Hope book, and it's a beautiful yeah. book, and um, and it's a great piece of the puzzle, so happy to surface that. Yeah, me too. I love Joanna. So, David, thank you. This was really brilliant. It was a, a quick conversation, but it felt like we got enough depth and, and substance here that really inspired. It inspired me, and 
I hope it inspired all those listening today. So we are going to gently hand this back to Felipe for some announcements. And Felipe, one more thing before you take over, if you would, and that is just the Social Change 2.0 Study Circle. You put that in the chat earlier. But for those who wish to do this in their communities or any issue that you're working on together, this helps you get the full power and value out of the, the book because you do it as a community. Absolutely. And I just posted it once again in the comments so people can access that link. Um, thank you so much both for what an incredible conversation. I also posted at the beginning of this, I mean, uh, in the in the links that I'm posting now in the comments, I posted the link for Peace on Earth 2030, the games. I am part of the cohort that is going on right now, and I have really been excited about it. And I encourage everyone that if you're not involved with it, you can visit our website because the next cohort starts in May, correct, David? May 15th. And if you go to peace, uh, peace2030.earth and click on events, you can register then. Perfect. Register so yeah. that is correct. So I have it right there and I put it on the comments. So um, next we have uh, American Textures, the Human Bridges is Crossing Border Education. This is practicing the art of dialogue to serve social justice. Join us for a heartfelt workshop that models the process of developing the skills for building trust, group cohesion, and open dialogue. This is three sessions. It begins February 22nd, which is this Friday, if I'm not mistaken, and it goes next week for two more days, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And I put, the again, the link on the comments. Um, Marilyn Turkovich, the executive director of our organization, Charter for Compassion, is playing sort of a DJ situation here and is presenting this webinar series, The Magical Ability of Music to Inspire Action. So in this way, we discover unique ways in which melodies guide us towards a gentler, more giving selves. This is every Wednesday until the end of March. And it starts at 7 a.m. Pacific time next week. I mean, today, I mean, tomorrow, but uh, after that is 8 a.m. every Wednesday. Um, then we also have the Charter Sangha, which is a moment of mindfulness, peace, re reflex reflecting, and meditation. And um, this is uh, guided by Marilyn McCarthy and another member of our community. And this happens every last Saturday. So this is every last Saturday of the month. And this is this Saturday, February 24th at 9 a.m. Pacific. Again, that link is on the comments as well. And we're super excited to have three global reads next month, which is very unheard of. We usually have one, maybe two. If it's this is a version of global reads for kids and company. This is Big Karma and Little Cosmo help each other. This is with Karen Ross and the um, facilitator is going to be Karen Light. This is Saturday, March second, at nine a.m. Pacific. And then we have uh, our global breathe in March. Global read in March is the Breathing Cure, and this is going to be on March six. And this is with the author Patrick McKinnon and our facilitator Shane O'Connor. And last but not least, we're going to have on Friday, March 8th um, at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, the book I Shall Not Hate by Dr. Izeldin Abulaish. And our facilitator is going to be Marge Andre, who has been participating on asking questions. Again, I just wanted to thank both of you for the incredible conversation, for the inspiration that you've given us all, and for the people that will be watching this to feel the inspiration to hopefully join the Peace on Earth Games and to keep evolving as we create more compassion and more ripples of compassion in our own communities and within ourselves. Thanks again, and we will see you for our next Global Read.